Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Alda T and I'm the Regional Community and Long-Term Care Coordinator with the Central East Stroke Network. On behalf of ACT, which is the Advisory Collaborative for Time, I would like to welcome you to this webinar today. For those of you who may not be familiar with the acronym TIME, TIME stands for Together in Movement and Exercise, which is a community-based exercise program for people with balance mobility limitations. Our speaker today is Nancy Salbach. Nancy will share the results of the qualitative study entitled How Does the Time Program or sorry, How the Time Program Affects the Daily Lives of Participants and Their Caregivers. The interest in this topic has been overwhelming. There are 50 sites online with multiple attendees at each site. It's really exciting to see sites from across the country with us today. We've got representatives from British Columbia all the way through to Nova Scotia, representing recreation providers, fitness instructors, healthline health care providers, and researchers as well. Before we begin, there's a few housekeeping items to share. The session is being recorded and will be posted online afterwards. A link to the recording will be sent to all registered participants. All microphones have been muted. Um, and there will be a question and answer period at the end. So at that time, I will unmute the line and then ask you to share your thoughts, feedback, and questions at that time. There is also a chat feature to the system where you can post questions as they arrive throughout the session and then Nancy will answer them at the end. At this point, I would like to formally introduce our speaker today. So Nancy Salbach is a physical therapist and associate professor, professor in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Toronto. She holds a CIHR New Investigator Award in Knowledge Translation and an Early Researcher Award from the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation. Dr. Salbach has, has published more than 60 research articles and obtained $1.3 million in research funding as a principal investigator. One of Dr. Salbach's research goals is to advance the implementation of community exercise programs to improve mobility and health in people with physical disability. Nancy has been involved with the TIME program since it was first piloted at two community centres in Toronto. In 2014, she led a meeting with Joanne Howe that brought TIME stakeholders from across Canada together in Toronto to create an action plan for expanding the TIME program. Healthcare and recreation providers, researchers and TIME program participants from this meeting agreed to form ACT, which stands for the Advisory Collaborative for TIME, to advance community exercise programs for people with balance mobility limitations. So on behalf of ACT, Nancy is presenting today on the results of the qualitative study, as I mentioned, which is how does the TIME program affect the daily lives of participants and their caregivers. So with that, I'll pass the system over to Nancy and she can uh, share her findings with us. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Alda. Okay. So um, I'm very pleased to present the results of this qualitative study to you today. Um, I, this study was conducted by my master's student, Syra Morali, and unfortunately she wasn't um, available to present it today, so I'm going to present the results on her behalf. The objectives of the webinar today are to understand the need for community exercise programs for people with neurological conditions, to understand the importance of studying caregivers, and to summarize the findings of the qualitative study, which was designed to explore the perceptions or opinions of participants with neurological conditions and caregivers on how the TIME program impacts physical function, participation, and caregiver assistance and health. I thought I'd start with a review of some terminology given the range of people that are attending the webinar. So when we talk about physical activity, we're, we're really speaking about any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. So gardening, for example, would represent physical activity just as much as participating in an exercise program. Exercise is a subset of physical activity that is planned, structured, and repetitive, and has as a final or an intermediate objective the improvement or maintenance of physical fitness. So the time clearly represents an exercise, an opportunity to exercise. ADL is an acronym that stands for Activities of Daily Living. And this acronym is used throughout the presentation today, so I wanted to make sure everybody understood it. And it refers to self-care activities that we do every day, such as bathing, dressing, toileting, walking, stairs, etc. And IADL 
um, it stands for Instrumental Activities of Daily Living. And this refers to higher level ADLs such as house cleaning, cooking, grocery shopping, and banking. We also commonly use certain terms um, that we uh, are usually termed as impairments, activity limitations, and participation restrictions. So just very briefly, when I use the term impairment, I'm referring to impairments in a physiological function of the body or an impairment in, the in one of the structures of the body, such as one of the muscles, for example. So when we talk about impaired strength, um, we're referring to an impairment. Um, activities refer to the ex execution of a task or an action by an individual. So walking, for example, is a, is a very good activity uh, example. And when we use the term participation, it refers to involvement in a life situation. And I'm going to define this further a little later. But it in, in refers to um, use participating in meaningful activities such as social uh, relationships, uh, occupation, etc. Okay, so let's get started. Um, as you may know, many Canadians live with a neurological condition. And I've highlighted here that um, a good number of Canadians, uh, over 400,000, according to a very current study, live with the effects of stroke. Um, approximately 94,000 Canadians live with multiple sclerosis, and I'll use the, the acronym MS in the presentation. 62 out of 100,000 Canadian adults have a traumatic brain injury, so about 21,000 people in Canada um, have a traumatic brain injury. So clearly neurological, neurological conditions affect a good number of adult Canadians and, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about their effects. The thing with these types of neurological conditions is they can cause a, a diverse range of sensory motor impairments. So I know most of you have, have met and worked with people who have had a stroke or who have multiple sclerosis and everyone is a bit different because everyone is experiencing a different combination of problems with motor function or their ability to move their limbs, sensory function, so they, they may have impaired ability to know where their joints are in space, space or impaired um, skin sensation. They will often have decreased coordination. Some people, um, people with stroke can experience cognitive problems where they have problems uh, focusing on a task or, or um, their short-term memory is affected which has implications in terms of us teaching uh, people with stroke how to exercise. Balanced self-efficacy refers to your perceived ability to balance or to maintain your, your body in space. Um, vision can also be affected by neurological conditions, and many people report fatigue. Depression is also um, a sequelae of neurological conditions as well as spasticity, unilateral neglect where people are not perceiving one half of their environment, expressive or receptive aphasia, meaning they have difficulty communicating or understanding when people speak to them, and also some people suffer from incontinence. So you can imagine that with these number of, of, of diverse impairments, they can really um, limit somebody's ability to participate in exercise, but they also uh, present challenges to teaching people to participate in exercise as well. So as a, as a result of these, um, these impairments, people with neurological conditions uh, commonly experience balance and mobility limitations. For example, people with stroke, in people with stroke, 83% have balance problems and over half uh, express difficulty walking. People with multiple sclerosis, also three quarters of them report having balance problems and almost all experience a, a mobility limitation over time. So balance and mobility limitations are common in people with neurological, limit, uh, neurological um, conditions. And I'm highlighting um, people with stroke and multiple sclerosis in particular because these two groups of people um, participate commonly in the TIME program. Balance and mobility limitations contribute to physical inactivity. So in one meta-analysis um, of, of studies of physical activity in people with stroke, they found that on average, people with stroke take just over 4,000 steps per day. And this is just over half of the number of steps per day that are recommended that people with uh, chronic illness take. People with MS take about 5,900 steps per day. So again, the, this, this measure, this particular measure of physical activity shows that um, people with neurological conditions are physically inactive. Balance and mobility limitations also restrict participation in meaningful activities. 
So here's this term participation again. So participation is involvement in a life situation, such as in relationships, in work, social and leisure activities. And in a very large cohort study of people with stroke, they found between 39 and 54 percent of people were limited in basic ADLs as well as higher level ADLs like housework and shopping. And at six months, 53 percent of people with stroke report being limited in performing a meaningful occupational, recreational, or social activity. Nearly 66% of individuals with MS are limited to perform ADLs and IADLs and to participate in social, lifestyle, or occupational activities. So participation is very important because it brings meaning to our lives. Participation in our relationships and in work uh, and in social and leisure activities, these are the things that can drive our well-being. So it's a very important aspect of, of, uh, of our life. Because people with neurological conditions do have um, a variety of both physical and mental health issues, um, their, their situation will impact uh, the, their caregiver. The caregiving role itself can have a negative impact on the caregiver's health. For example, caregiver assistance can result in caregiver burden, social isolation, emotional stress, reduced quality of life, and financial strain. In fact, the prevalence of caregiver burden is between 25 to 54 percent. And for people with stroke, caregivers um, experience caregiver burden for an indefinite period of time after the per their loved one has had a stroke. And very interestingly, 45 percent of caregivers of people with stroke are at risk for depression. So it's very important to consider the health of caregivers of people with neurological conditions. You might be asking yourself, what defines a caregiver? So in, the, in our study, we defined a family caregiver as an unpaid family member, friend, or neighbor who is most closely involved in helping the individual with a neurological condition to live independently at home and provides uh, support and assistance with ADLs and IADLs at least once a week. So, People with neurological conditions experience personal barriers to participating in community exercise programs. You can imagine that after someone has um, received a diagnosis of MS or has had a stroke or an acquired brain injury and they are experiencing physical limitations, they, um, they describe in qualitative research that they, don't, that they lack a knowledge of how or where to exercise. They also fear that the effort of exercising in an unsupervised environment uh, may cause an adverse health event, such as a heart attack. So the photo of the gentleman in the bottom is showing that he's suffering some, some uh, chest pain. Also, the exercise self-efficacy refers to your confidence uh, in your ability to exercise. And people with neurological conditions describe that they lack confidence in exercising on their own. They also may feel embarrassed. Embarrassment um, in terms of that they don't move as they used to before, the quality of movement has changed, and so they may feel embarrassed to exercise in front of others. And also, when you think of the community center environment, they may be embarrassed to, um, to use the change rooms uh, and to be uh, with, with, um, in the public eye, so to speak, uh, given their, their, their new, um, I guess, given the impairments that they are living with. People with neurological conditions also describe feeling a lack of motivation uh, to exercise. And so these are considered personal barriers to participating in community exercise programs. When people with neurological conditions have been interviewed, they also talk about environmental barriers to participating in community exercise programs. Um, they, uh, surveys of uh, physical therapists have indicated that there is a lack of available and appro available appropriate exercise programs in their communities. People with neurological conditions describe how they find it challenging to enter buildings. There may not be a wide enough access to walk with their mobility devices or in their wheelchair, to use their wheelchair. Also, when you think of, of exercise gyms, there often is not enough space to move in between the equipment um, if you're using a mobility device. Um, people also talk about um, that they may not find instructors in community centers who have worked with people with 
uh, neurological conditions before and who may not have the expertise to guide them in safe and appropriate exercise. Other barriers involve the cost of participating in programs as well as transportation. Um, people with neurological conditions may not be able to drive anymore. That means that they would require adaptive transport or have a, a family member or friend drive them to the community center to participate in exercise programs. So for all of these reasons, um, the time model was created. So Joanne Howe, Karen Brenton, and Catherine Salisbury were three physical therapists at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute at the University Health Network. And they realized and recognized these challenges facing people with neurological conditions at the time of discharge from the healthcare system. And so they, um, they thought of a very innovative model, which was the time model, um, wherein they would partner as healthcare professionals with the recreation, uh, with recreation centers um, to implement a community-based exercise program in community centers. Um, the, this model overcomes a number of the personal and environmental challenges that we described on the last two slides. And at the heart of this model is the partnership created where physical therapists train fitness instructors in community centers to deliver uh, an exercise program that is known to be safe and appropriate for people with neurological conditions, and they provide ongoing support. And the fitness instructors and community partners provide uh, the expertise and experience in providing recreation for people of all ages and the infrastructure in terms of the community center and space and equipment to run these programs. For those of you um, less familiar with the TIME program online, the TIME program has four key ingredients. The first is that it involves task-related training, which is the practice of progressively challenging functional tasks. Um, also, the TIME program involves a group exercise program. Um, it, the healthcare partner involved in the TIME program provides ongoing training and support for instructors and refers people to the TIME program. And the recreation partner runs the time program in a community center. So just to give you a little more details about these, these key ingredients, task-related training is the practice of progressively challenging functional tasks. And there have been many, many randomized controlled trials providing evidence that this type of training works. And it has led to improvements in sit-to-stand ability, walking independence, distance, and speed. And um, it allows you to address several impairments simultaneously. So as you are practicing your step-ups, you are working on coordination, balance, strength, as well as the functional task of stepping to use stairs. And the ability to have or the, the um, existence of multiple levels of difficulty within each task allows the fitness instructor to make the task more difficult as needed or less difficult, depending on how the person with a neurological condition may feel on any given day. And I want to point out that the time program, as it is now, is open to anyone with balance and mobility limitations. It is not limited to people with neurological conditions. But the focus of this webinar today is on people with neurological conditions. The time program involves the practice of exercises at exercise stations, organized either in series or in three super stations where the exercises are clustered. And as you can see from the blue bubbles, these um, exercises really relate to things we do or movements we do every single day. And the, attract, the uh, advantage of these types of exercises is that they're easy to teach, they're easy to progress. We are all familiar with doing these, these movements, and the program doesn't require sophisticated or expensive equipment. The time program involves a group exercise in a class size of approximately 12 people. And the benefits of, having, of exercising in a group are motivation, building confidence in your ability to move, uh, to do the exercises in the class, social support, fun, and as a result, better adherence to the program. The third key ingredient of the time program is the, is the role of the healthcare partner. Um, the healthcare partner in the beginning, when the time program is initially implemented, provides a workshop to train fitness instructors, attends the first few classes, and can drop in and provide feedback on how the classes run. Um, refresher se sessions are also provided to fitness instructors um, over time. And the healthcare partner 
and, and colleagues at the uh, healthcare institution can also refer patients who meet the admission criteria for the TIME program. And the admission criteria are that the person has a balance and mobility limita limitation from any underlying condition. Um, commonly, people with stroke and MS participate in the TIME program. And they also should be able to walk a minimum of 10 meters with or without a walking aid, unassisted, um, in order to be able to do the exercises in the TIME program. The involvement of a healthcare partner has been found to be reassuring to patients because they, they understand that healthcare professionals have expertise in helping people with movement problems and they know that if, if a healthcare professional is involved in the program, then the exercises should be safe and appropriate for them. The fourth uh, ingredient to the TIME program is really the role of the recreation or community partner. The community centers implement the program, fitness instructors run the class, usually two per class. They also have uh, the ability to recruit volunteers who are trained and they provide um, the recommended four to one ratio of participants to staff. Um, the recreation centers have space and equipment and provide the necessary handholds for safety to run the class. And they have the infrastructure to offer the registration for the TIME programs. So you can see in this photo, um, we have uh, the TIME program being run at Toronto's Waterfront Neighborhood Centre. So even though we have a wealth of evidence supporting task-oriented training in people with stroke, um, these types of programs in the lip described in the literature were provided by a rehabilitation professional. So when the TIME program was first developed, it was unclear whether um, the same benefits and whether the safety and feasibility of the program could be duplicated when the program was run in the community um, by fitness instructors. So way back in 2007, we conducted a pilot study of the TIME program to evaluate the safety, feasibility, and potential benefit of the model. We ran a 12-week program with two classes per week, each one hour long and we administered standardized measures of balance and mobility to the time participants before and after the program. We also conducted a focus group with the exercise participants and any caregivers that assisted. Six fitness instructors were recruited and trained at two community centers run by a municipal recreation division. Fourteen people with balance and mobility limitations registered and two caregivers assisted and most of the participants were people with stroke. <clears throat> the program was judged to be safe. Out of 293 attendances, there were two adverse events, no injuries and no medical attention required. The program was judged to be feasible. The instructor training was completed and participants attended 92% of the classes. And the program was judged to be potentially beneficial. In a subgroup analysis of just the nine people with stroke, we noted that uh, the people with stroke significantly improved in balance and walking ability as measured by the Berg Balance Scale and the six-minute walk test. We also conducted one focus group at each center, so two focus groups in total. And, and the time participants noted that they improved in their balance and lower limb strength and that these improvements helped them to be more independent in their self-care activities their transfers, their household activities, and reduce the need for assistance from others. And so this was very interesting information because usually people talk about the time, the task-oriented training having benefits to balance and mobility, but with, there wasn't a lot of evidence showing that this type of training could carry over to ADL activities and reduce need for caregiver assistance. Um, Syra, my master's student, she conducted a scoping review of the literature and found that there were few studies involving, uh, a few studies evaluating task-oriented exercise programs incorporating a healthcare recreation partnership. And that um, among these studies, uh, there were a limited number that examined physical function, ADLs, and participation as outcomes. Uh, two studies and uh, assessed and observed no impact on caregiver assistance of the exercise program, but they used a measure called the caregiver strain index that only had a, like a two-category response scale, so that was considered a limitation. And there were no studies evaluating the outcome of caregiver health. So why did we go ahead then and conduct this qualitative study? 
Well, little apparent from the literature review, little was known about the effects of exercise models like the time program on ADL function and participation in people with a neurological condition. And little was known about caregiver assistance and help. This was really a new and emerging area of the literature. Um, we really needed evidence from, or we do need evidence from a well-designed randomized trial to justify the widespread implementation of the time program and funding for the time program in Canada. But before we do this larger study, we needed to have a better understanding of how participation in the time program could affect physical function, participation, caregiver assistance and health to, afford, to inform what we might measure in this larger study. So we decided to um, use qualitative research methodology to conduct our study. And this type of method, which commonly involves using interviews or focus groups, was considered ideal to get an in-depth understanding of experiences in the, with the time program. It allows people to provide uh, or to describe uh, the, what they experience in their own words. So the objective of the qualitative study that Syra conducted was to explore the perceptions, or you could say opinions, of people with neurological conditions and their caregivers of the effects of the time program on the following outcomes. On physical function, meaning balance, mobility, and ADL function, participation in meaningful activities, caregiver assistance, and caregiver health. So of course we didn't want to just ask uh, the time participants about the impact on these outcomes, we also wanted to interview caregivers to ask them about their perceptions. So we conducted what's called a descriptive qualitative study. We did face-to-face -face or telephone interviews after people had completed the time program. We interviewed time participants and caregivers separately, and the interviewer took notes after each interview and the interviews were audio recorded and transcribed. So who did we invite to participate? Well, in terms of the exercise participants, we of course were wanting people who reported balance and mobility deficits due to a neurological condition. They had to be registered in the time program. They had to have a caregiver. Uh, using the definition of a caregiver that I presented earlier. They had to be adults, defined as aged 18 and older, and able to speak and read English um, in order to complete questionnaires and participate in the interview. So people who had moderate or severe aphasia, judged by the time instructor, were excluded from the study, given that we didn't think they would be able to participate adequately in an interview. Caregivers were invited to participate if they met our definition of a caregiver, which was helping the individual with a neurological condition to live independently at home and provide support and assistance with basic and instrumental ADLs at least once a week. And they also, of course, needed to be able to speak and read English. And we only invited people who were unpaid. Uh, so people who were paid personal support workers were excluded. We recruited participants from five local sites, meaning um, near the university, near in and around Toronto, and six remote sites um, that were geographically at a greater distance from the University of Toronto. All of these sites were providing the time program, and we did recruit. We we did allow people who were registered in the time program for the first time, as well as people who had already been in the time program, uh, to participate. And we just monitored uh, whether or not they were first-time registrants, registrants or repeat registrants. Because we knew that the number of time sessions that they had participated in would influence their opinions of, their, of how it had impacted them. So how did we analyze the data? Well, the audio recordings were, were um, transcribed. And so we reviewed them to make sure they were accurate, compared them to the audio recordings. And in qualitative analysis, what you do is you review the transcripts and you create codes that apply to sections of the text, so to sections of what people said that have a particular meaning. meaning sorry. And codes were reviewed by three authors and then applied to all the transcripts. And then what you do is you um, compare the coded sections of text, so the text that has the same code, we compare them for similarity and differences. 
And we use this terminology of impairments, activity limitations, and participation restrictions in um, reporting on our findings. So in the end, 25 people recruited from six uh, different time programs were interviewed. 13 of them were exercise participants, 9 had suffered a stroke, and 4 had multiple sclerosis. So those were the only two um, neurological conditions of participants in our study. Um, among the exercise participants, about half were men and half were women, and the median age was 69 years. 12 caregivers were interviewed. We did initially have 13, but one person dropped out of the study. Almost all of the caregivers were spouses, but you can see in this slide one person was a child and one was a parent. And there were, um, uh, there were five men, seven women, and the median age was 61 years. The interviews lasted about an hour. So one very important issue is that the time program was not delivered in exactly the same way across the sites. So because the, time pro the exercises are the same, but in terms of the number of times a week that the program is offered and the number of weeks that the program is offered, that does vary across recreation uh, organizations. So on this slide, what I show you is that um, time uh, that we had five people, time, five exercise participants who were registered for the first time, and uh, four of them participated in a 10-week program, and one participated in a 12-week program. And then we had eight people who were actually re-registrants in the time program. And you can see here that three of them had done, had completed two sessions, one had completed actually three sessions of an 11-week program, and four had done quite a number, four or more time sessions. Um, and so there was variability in terms of, of you know, the number of exercise programs they had completed. Also, interestingly, we did uh, monitor whether they were participating in other exercise programs at the recreation center, which is, of course, a huge advantage to running these programs in a community recreation center. So um, half of the participants described participating in other programs like chair yoga or aqua therapy. So in terms of our results, so after we read all of the transcripts, what we found is that participants perceived, we, we found what we called two main themes. So the first main theme was that participants definitely perceived benefits that they linked to the time program. So even though they did participate in other programs, they specifically talked about movements that they were able to do better now, and they compared them to movements they practiced in the time program. So um, there were two sub-themes, which is what A and B represent as part of this first. And the first sub-theme is that people talked about how improvements in their body function, their activity, and participation were interrelated. And also that if they repeated their registration in the time program, that that reinforced the benefits that they experienced. So that's not a surprise, right? Um, the second main theme is that caregivers experience challenges and benefits associated with the time program. So in the next slides, I'm going to give you a little more detail about these themes with some quotes. So the first sub-theme was that benefits were interrelated. So exercise participants and caregivers agreed on experiences, on the following experiences. They, both of these groups talked about how the time participant um, experienced improvements uh, such as in strength and confidence that led to improvements at a higher level, like at an activity level. So um, at the in terms of ADLs and mobility, and also at the participation level, such as leisure participation and social participation. So for example, um, people described increases in muscle strength, such as in the core uh, and legs, and Approximately half of participants and some caregivers described this, and they talked about how these benefits led to improvements in their ability to maintain balance, their ability to walk, transfer, go up and down stairs, and perform activities of daily living. So here we have two quotes. The first one is from a participant with MS, and they say, I think it's increased my core strength and keeping some strength in my legs so I can keep walking getting in and out of a car, getting up off the couch, it helps you with your regular day-to-day -day activities because you're keeping your strength up. And then a caregiver of someone with stroke noted, he can vacuum now, 
So vacuuming would be considered an IADL, it's a household activity. What else is he doing? Making the bed, he's starting to do some cooking, he takes his own shower, he can go outside the house into the garage now by himself, like he can go up and down the stairs, there's only three but he can do them, and he walks outside the yard and fixes his birdhouses. So fixing birdhouses is more a leisure activity, it's, it's a, an enjoyable activity. So you can see that, um, that this caregiver is describing how um, uh, the person, the time participant is experiencing um, improvements at the activity level but also at the participation level. One re-registrant with stroke described a decreased need for his walking aid as a result of his improved balance. So he says, I came home with a cane, I walked with a cane, and then when I started the time program, it got to the point where I stopped using the cane, except if I was going through rough ground or snow or something like that. Then I used the cane not because I necessarily needed it, but because it was a piece of security as a safety thing that if I had a problem, then there was something to help me. So a reduced need for mobility aids is definitely a very important outcome um, that is potentially linked to the time program by this participant. One first-time registrant with stroke stated that the time program gave him confidence to walk longer distances without the use of his walking aid. But confidence in terms of taking, like the few times I started to walk without this, referring to the cane, was with time. They had small distances to walk, and I'd say, okay, I'll try it without a cane. And I did it a few times, and then I did it, like today I did it more today than any other time. So yeah, it gives you confidence. And his caregiver also agreed with the increased confidence witnessed in the participant's mobility and said he has more confidence when he has to move. And when he does this exercise there, the time program, he can see, oh, I can do that. Oh, I can do that. So very clearly, confidence was something that, um, that a certain, a good number of participants uh, experienced. And you can see from the quote how they specifically relate it to activities that they do in the time program. Most of the participants and most of the caregivers described social support they experienced through the time program, including meeting new pe people with similar conditions or difficulties that they could talk about or relate to. A few participants and one caregiver of a re-registrant stated that time participants formed friendships with other time participants and interacted with these individuals outside of the time program by enjoying activities such as going out for coffee. So this is definitely a beneficial outcome that relates to social participation. Approximately half of the participants and half of the caregivers described improvement in participation in leisure activities. So one participant said, it let me get out to play a little bit of golf with my wife. Not very good golf, but I was able to get out there. I'm able to go out and have a nice meal in a restaurant with my spouse. I'm able to go visit my kids and grandchildren, and when they come here, I can participate more with them. And if friends are coming over, or if we go to friends, it's no longer, it's an expedition when you go out sometimes. So here we can see again the importance of, of uh, enhanced uh, leisure participation and social participation. Repeated registration uh, was an issue in terms of eight participants said that they had previously registered in the time program. And they noted that repeated, re uh, repeated registration reinforced the benefits that they experienced. So as one person with stroke noted, after the first time program, it did change. It got better. But of course, the more I go, the better it gets. And that's why I keep going. So we don't see the time program as being a one-time only uh, intervention, so to speak. The time program has really provided an, ex uh, an opportunity to participate in, in exercise that can really be lifelong. And so it's something where people are encouraged to participate um, again as long as that the level of difficulty of the exercise remains appropriate. Caregivers, in terms of the second theme, caregivers experienced both challenges and benefits of, uh, the, with the time program. Um, the primary challenge was providing transportation to the, the, the time program, and this was described by over half of caregivers. Just so you know, about half of the caregivers actually engaged or, or took, took part in the time program. Either they provided assistance and motivation, or some of them actually did the exercises as well. Other caregivers used the time to do other activities like shopping, household tasks, exercising, or working full time. 
Over half of exercise participants and some caregivers felt that participants required less assistance from caregivers in various areas, such as balance, mobilities, and activities of daily living. As one caregiver put it, it's so much easier to go out for dinner now because I don't need to take the walker. He can walk with me and whatnot, so that's easier. And to go to a movie, the same thing. All these things, anything out, he can do with me, and I don't need to be carrying a, picking up a walker and putting it in the car and all that sort of thing. So, you know, we can basically do anything like that. So this quote really helps to show that going out to do, um, uh, you know, what you would call leisure or social activities, going out for dinner, going out, uh, going out to see a movie, that uh, the caregiver, um, if, if the person in the exercise class is improving in their ability to move, and they have a less of a need for a mobility device, then that means the caregiver doesn't need to provide as much assistance and doesn't have to do things like lifting walkers in and out of the car. And you have to remember that um, stroke in particular occurs um, more commonly to people, to older adults. So the average age of people with stroke is, is high, in the high 60s and, and early 70s. So of course the caregiver is also, uh, in terms of the spouses, uh, is also an older adult. So um, you can imagine that at that age, if you're providing physical assistance and lifting walkers and whatnot, that that can be a bit of a strain. In terms of uh, some caregivers attended the time program because at first they were concerned that the participant might sustain a fall during the class. But as they saw their loved one improve, then they saw that they no need, longer needed to attend. And instead they talked about using the time to do other things. So as one caregiver described it, um, she said, oh, everything I do, shopping, messages, I mean all kinds of things, all kinds of things. That just means that I don't have to go out again or we don't have to stay out longer or whatever. Like I don't go and have coffee, you know what I mean? It's all work-related within the house. And what was a really interesting finding was that the majority of caregivers described an emotional benefit of the time program. So when we talk about emotional benefit, this lies in the realm of mental health. And health was one of the outcomes that has not been previously studied um, of caregivers as a result of task-oriented uh, training programs in people with neurological conditions. So this result was really important. So the majority of caregivers said they described feeling positive, happy, or optimistic as they saw the impact of the time program on their loved ones. They felt more relaxed about the participants' capabilities as they witnessed improvements in physical function. So as one caregiver of someone with MS said, I feel happy when she goes and does something that she feels is good for her. And when she comes home, she's happy. That makes me happy and makes me more relaxed than to just see her sitting at home doing nothing. So I really love that quote, and it really, uh, it's, it's, it's an emotional quote, and it, it really makes you realize uh, the, the important role that the time program can play. So in terms of feeling pride and happiness, one caregiver had said um, that attending the class also allowed her to do the exercises for her own physical health. So she said, with the exercise I do, it's better for me to be there because if I go, I put him there and I leave. And I know he won't be able to do a lot of the exercise by himself. So if I can help him, it's better for me. And I'm more proud of me. And it's great for him at the same time to help him to do that. And when he can do different things, to push something, to lift something, for him it's better. And it's better for me. I'm happy with what I do for him. So that's like a positive benefit of caregiving. It's, it's, it's something that this caregiver has to do, feels she has to do, she has to attend the program, but she's getting a positive um, a, a, a benefit from it um, in terms of feeling proud, proud of herself and proud of her loved one. And she also stated, I do the exercise at the same time as him. I like to do that, and for me it's great. It pushed me to do some exercise, and I had to do that by myself, Maybe I'm a little bit lazy to do that, but because I go with him, I do the exercise. So we're getting to the end of the, uh, the talk, and we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Um, in terms of limitations of this study, uh, of course, we, we had um, a limited sample size to be able to compare people who had only completed one time program versus people who had the, uh, been in the time program previously. So um, recall there were eight people who were re-registrants and uh, there were five people who were first-time registrants. 
<clears throat> as well, we only had a few individuals with MS. Um, only people with stroke and MS were represented in our study sample, um, so not people with other neurological conditions. So the transferability of the findings to populations beyond stroke is somewhat limited. So in conclusion, people with stroke and MS and their caregivers perceive benefits from group task-oriented training within the time model that are similar, really, to the programs um, described in the literature in all of those randomized trials where the program is delivered by healthcare professionals. So what this represents is a successful translation from the healthcare uh, setting to the community setting. Participants and caregivers noted enhanced benefits of repeated attendance. This supports the role of the TIME program in increasing access to exercise programs and providing ongoing, really lifelong opportunities for health maintenance and improvement. And family member engagements, and this acronym here is community-based exercise programs, may also benefit caregivers. The TIME program may help mitigate negative health outcomes that caregivers experience when caring for someone with a physical disability. So, as you may all know, the TIME program is now running in over 40 centers across Canada. And, of course, that sounds like a big number, but there's a lot of people out there that have a need for this program. So, we can't kind of, you know, uh, take a break. We have to keep promoting this, this model. And, really, the program has grown because of the champions and partners across the country, the obvious need for the program, and the feasibility of implementing it. And we have to maintain the program integrity to keep ensuring that it it is to be safe and a high quality program. And so just to finish off, I have to acknowledge, of course, Syra Morali for assisting with the slides and conducting the study. And as part of her thesis committee were Jill Cameron and Ruth Barclay. I have to thank Joanne Howe, who provided some slides, and of course she was a, a, the ultimate resource throughout the project. And also to acknowledge ACT. Um, and all of their support with re my research and the TIME program. I'd like to thank Alda T from the Central East Stroke Network for making this webinar happen, and the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute within the University Health Network. For uh, I'm a, an adjunct scientist at Toronto Rehab, and of course they uh, provide and um, uh, steer the TIME program, and our ongoing co collaboration is fantastic. And of course our funders that are noted here, um, we couldn't do this type of research without funding from these organizations. And finally, this study could not have been possible without the support and collaboration of the recreation organizations listed on this slide and the individuals. We, 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 we did get participants from six of these sites, but we recruited at all of them, and we're really grateful for everyone's collaboration. So now I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that people have. Thank you.